Hello, my name is Kevin Mark. Uh, I'll be providing you uh, resources for SEC 201 lectures during this spring one term. Your professor has already spoken to you uh, the first week of classes, so I'm going to start uh, midway, or I would say maybe a quarter way through my slides. Uh, not discussing about the grading system, etc. So if you have any questions, you can email me at kmark at lagcc.cuny.edu. Or of course, you can email or contact your respective SEC 201 lecturers. So tips on studying for this class. Um, keep up with your work. Uh, complete all assignments, you will have exams, you will have uh, sapling homework, which you will continue to do. If you're short on time for whatever reason, you should try to do as many uh, problems as you can and then go back to the notes to see, to help you out to solve these problems. But if you're short on time, do as many problems as you can. This course is, focuses on applying knowledge. So we have not set up a schedule yet for tutoring uh, because of our circumstances. However, when it comes up, uh, I'll let you know. There's the science study hall in E342, where you can have group studying, or you can use the Student Government Association, uh, room 1M165. There you make an appointment beforehand, either online or through a phone call, and there you can have one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Again, both of these programs are provided by the college, uh, not up and running yet um, until we get some more clarity on the situation. Important to have your LAGCC email available. This is to maintain contact with your professor. If you need to hand in assignments via email, that's one way to do it as well. Um, but this is to ensure that we can maintain contact with you during this time. These notes will appear on YouTube. I'll provide the link on our common SEC 201 Blackboard account. This is in addition to your regular Blackboard account for your class. There's going to be a common Blackboard account, uh, which is open to all students and instructors under my organizations and there I will provide uh, these slides or the link to YouTube for these slides. Well, one thing I like to tell my class is that chemistry is learning chemistry is kind of like learning a language. Um, I cannot just provide you notes. I cannot just give you the a dictionary and write definitions on the on the board to really understand how to speak chemistry, to really understand how to make sentences in a language, you have to take those words and understand how to apply. In language, this is done by making sentences. In chemistry, you have to do problems. You have to apply the knowledge from the notes and do as many problems as you can. And if you want to become versed in a particular language, you would throw yourself in the particular country that speaks that language. And in chemistry, I always recommend to my students to do research. So there you can become fluent in the particular field or in that language. So understand, obviously understand the notes, but more importantly, try to apply those notes when you're doing problems. I'm going to try to do as many problems as I can. Um, if you have any questions, of course, ask me or your respective professor. When I do questions, I'm going to have the question at the top, of course, and then I'll have the answer in the bottom right-hand corner. The worked out step-by-step -step problems will be posted on the Common CUNY Blackboard site for SEC 201. This is to ensure that you actually give the problem a try, and then if you're stuck you didn't get, or you didn't get the same answer, you can always refer back to the uh, worked out answers that I'll provide again on the CUNY common site.
SEC 201 under my organizations. Is there any questions? Let me just first see if this works. Here we go. Okay, make sure my marker is working. So what is chemistry and why do we care about it? So when I was an undergraduate student, I at the time didn't know really what field to pursue. But as your textbook says, central science, chemistry is a central science. So if you wanted to pursue medicine, chemistry is a good base. If you wanted to pursue biochemistry or physical chemistry or theoretical chemistry, or if you want to study um, the environment, that's one big area that's growing, environmental chemistry, how to help our planet. Uh, there's homeland security. For instance, when you go through the airport, you put your arms up. There's an analytical detector that goes around that can uh, detect the chemicals that are on you or the explosives if you have any. If you for instance, watch the show CSI, forensic science, is a big branch of chemistry. Uh, there you learn about analytical chemistry, you learn about biology uh, as well. So many avenues to pursue if you have chemistry as a base. Chemistry is a study of matter. So there are three states of matter, solid, liquid, gas. So for solids, let's take a look at water. So ice, it has a specific shape has a definite volume. Liquid, you have a specific shape, a definite volume. So if you have some water, you put it in the cup, or if you put it in the toilet, it's going to take the shape of its container. And gases, no specific shape, no definite volume. Pure substances, we can look at the big level, we say microscopic level, but you can also look at the same um, components and the very sub-microscopic level on the atoms and molecules. If we focus on pure substances, where you, you cannot decompose them into simpler substances, those of you, some of you may take physics, and that's debatable, of course, bringing it down to quarks. Um, but for this class, we'll say elements are the most simple uh, form. We have compounds, which are made up of elements. And we'll speak a little bit to the difference between a molecule and a compound. But elements and compounds are in the pure substance category. If we extend this, pure substance versus mixtures, a pure substance is only made up of one thing. For instance, water. Pure water is one thing, NaCl is one thing, versus mixtures. Mixture is made up of many things. We have homogeneous mixture, we have heterogeneous mixture, and we'll talk about those uh, later, but mixtures can be separated, whether it be through your hands, just pulling things apart, whether it be through filtration, whether it be through distillation. There are many methods to separate things out in a mixture. So pure substances, some examples, water, NaCl salt, if you do lines, uh, those are pure substances, hopefully. And if you have mixtures, for instance here, orange juice can be considered a mixture because it has the juice and the pulp. Um, beer, it has the foam and the liquid. Pepper, you can separate the different uh, little components out. We focus on uh, mixtures still, homogeneous, meaning one. So these are examples where you look at something and you only see one thing. For instance, air, you see one thing. However, we know it's composed of many things such as nitrogen, which is about 70%, oxygen, 20%. Um, we have carbon dioxide, uh, water, and other small uh, elements of air as well. Salt water, you only see one thing clear liquid, but you can also separate that out. Heterogeneous mixture, hetero means more than one. So Italian dressing, Italian salad, 
uh, you can separate those things out as well. Spaghetti with meatballs, of course, you can separate that out into its components of meatballs and spaghetti and sauce, etc. This is just a, a review. We have matter into pure substances in green versus mixtures in purple. Pure substances, we have elements or compounds. Mixtures, we have homogeneous mixture where we only see one thing, but we know it's made up of many things. And heterogeneous, we can separate those out. So I like to usually ask my class some questions. For instance, carbon dioxide, I would ask you, is it a compound, element, heterogeneous mixture, or homogeneous mixture? Carbon dioxide is a compound, CO2. Maple syrup, homogeneous mixture. You usually only see one thing in maple syrup. Cranberry juice, that's debatable. You, you have the juice, of course, but sometimes you see flakes of berries in there, tiny flakes. So it can be homogeneous, heterogeneous, D, concrete, heterogeneous, oh, I'm sorry, mixture, you only see uh, one thing. Although that's also debatable too, now that I think about it. Sometimes you see stones, sometimes you see uh, other things in the concrete. Um, copper metal is an element. Mercury is an element, Hg. E, copper, Cu. Italian dressing, as we talked about earlier, that's a heterogeneous mixture. And soil heterogeneous mixture, separated out, you know, you have bugs in there, you have other rocks in there, etc. And again, I have the answers here posted on the uh, bottom. I said with uh, heterogeneous mixtures, or any kind of mixtures, you can separate them out. These are two uh, processes. One is distillation, here where you have salt water, You heat up the salt water, the water will evaporate, and all you're left with is salt. And then you have water here dripping uh, in the collection area. We have filtration, so if I took my orange juice, put it through a filter, of course the filter size is important, the pore size. Uh, you can separate out the pulp from the juice as well. So we like to describe the properties, composition, and behavior of matter. So here we have some properties of matter, mass, volume, color, odor, density, melting points, boiling points, flammability, acidity. There is some properties of matter. On the right side, we talk about an extensive property, meaning that if you change the amount of it, the quantity will change as well. So if I have, if I want to measure the mass of something, if I add, if I add more of it, uh, that will be considered an extensive property because I'm changing the amount, changing its mass. Conversely, I have something like intensive property, which are the purple ones and the blue ones. And what do I mean? For instance, the density of water, pure water is one gram per mil. Um, always true on this. Obviously, it's not obviously, but it's also temperature and pressure dependent. But we'll say that for our class, the density of water is one gram per mil. This is an intensive property. Why? If I took water uh, from a cup, if I took water from a big bathtub, even though there's more water in the bathtub than the cup, the density of water will still be one gram per mil. So it doesn't depend on the amount of it that you have. The boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. If uh, we wanted to measure acidity or flammability, for instance, I take a piece of wood, I want to check if it's flammable, whether I have lots of wood, whether I have a little bit of wood, uh, the flammability is still consistent and constant. On the left side, I have a physical property, meaning if I changed um, something physical of it, for instance, if I take ice and I melt the ice, I can get back the original water. Sorry, if I have ice and I melt it to water, I can get back the original ice by freezing versus 
a chemical property, flammability, acidity, you cannot get back the original uh, com composition. If I take an apple, I let it sit there for a month, it's going to rot, and oxidize, I can never get back the original apple. That is a chemical property. Observed without changing identity or composition for physical properties and chemical properties, how a substance may react with other substances. So let's try as a class, physical or chemical change. The shovel rusting is a chemical property. You can never get back the original shovel. Breaking a plate, I would say that's a physical change because you can actually glue things back together to get the original plate, You're not changing anything chemically. Putting sugar in tea, that is a physical change. Uh, physical property, you can get back the sugar and the tea by itself through distillation. Lighting a match is a chemical property. You'll never get back at that match once you light it. E, grinding a rock to powder, I would say that's a physical change. For, for you to get back that original rock, of course you'd have to take it down into deep earth where it's hot, where there's high pressures to form that rock again. And burning of sugar is a chemical property. You'll never get back the original sugar once you burn it. Extensive or intensive property, length, mass, those are extensive properties. Their values change when you add different amounts. Color and density, those are intensive properties because if you have something that's blue, the sky, it's going to remain that, well, I shouldn't say the sky, because the sky color can change, but if you have a piece of paper, it's white. Whether you have lots of it, little of it, it's still going to be white. Uh, same goes with density. The density of that piece of paper is going to be the same, whether you have a lot of it or a little bit of, uh, of paper. Measuring properties. So from now on, in your chemistry careers, in lecture or in lab, every time you report an answer, you must have a number and its associated unit. You must have a number and associated unit. This is important in science and in general, because the room could be 25 degrees Fahrenheit. If you were to go to another country, perhaps they don't use Fahrenheit in their temperatures. You would say the temperature is 25. Someone else might interpret that differently because you did not apply unit. This is important in science as well. If I were to do an experiment in North America and I report that unit, so I report that value, I want someone in another part of the world to be able to repeat my experiment. However, I would need to write down the same unit. Um, in this case, for temperature, it would be Kelvin in the scientific community, which we'll talk about later. So always report your answers on an exam with a number and a unit. And in the lab, always use the proper unit and with its associated number. As I just said, everything should have a number uh, with it a unit. For length, you can say inch, foot, meter, or mile. You can report in these different units. However, there is, we'll talk about it in a minute, uh, an accepted. A common unit in science, mass, gram, pound, if you're in the UK, stones, time, seconds, minutes, hours, years, uh, etc. For temperature, in the United States, I believe we use Fahrenheit. In other parts of the world, we use Celsius. In the science world, we use Kelvin. Volume, which is a measure of the amount of space contained within an object. The unit for volume, I guess if you have the length in meters, the width in meters, and the height in meters, uh, the unit for volume will be meters cubed. Be meters cubed. If the length is meter, 
the width is meter, and the height is meter. So I just said here, you multiply the three out, one times one times one is one, and the unit will be meter cubed. So the volume of this particular question will be one meter cubed. If I had uh, a length, width, and height of 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters, you multiply the three numbers, you get 1,000, and centimeter cubed. Centimeter times centimeter times centimeter is centimeter cubed. One important thing you'll probably need in your labs here, we have one centimeter cubed is the same thing as saying one milliliter. I'll repeat, one centimeter cubed is the same thing as saying one milliliter. So a scientific governing, governing body came together and decided these are the common units we will all adopt when reporting data in science. And these are called SI units. I believe it's French for Système International d'Unité, or International System of Units. And here we have, for mass, it's kilogram. For length, it's meter. For electric current, which we will not discuss, ampere. For time, it's seconds. For temperature, it's Kelvin, not Celsius, not Fahrenheit. And the last one we will be talking about is amount of substance, a mole, which is quite common. Uh, def term we will be using in this class. So properties of matter, density. Density is a measure of the amount of mass within a given volume of a substance. Here we have mass divided by volume is equal to density. M over V is equal to density. If we have a particular question here, we have the volume is 340 centimeter cubed. We have a mass of 8 kilograms. We have an equation. So we know, I was speaking to you earlier in the class, we want to take knowledge, for instance, density is mass over volume. We want to apply this knowledge. So usually we give questions where we have to understand the equation to use and apply the numbers that are given. So in this case, 8 kilograms is the mass. 340 centimeters cubed is the volume. We do mass divided by volume. It gives us 0 0.024 kilograms per centimeter cubed. Again, everything has a unit. Everything has a number. Let's give it a try. What is the mass of a bar of aluminum having a volume of 2.0 milliliters and its density is 2.7 grams per mil? You can pause the video at this second and try on your own. Okay, we use the formula D equals M over V. We know the volume, 2.0 milliliters. We know the density. We need to find the mass. So if we really manipulate this equation, mass equals to D times V. And we can plug in the values and hopefully you'll get an answer of 5.4 grams. So again, the worked out answers will be posted on the CUNY Common Blackboard site. Um, but I'm just giving you hints on what approach to take. For the following question, a beaker contains one liter of water piece of metal which weighs 11.3 grams, so mass equals 11.3. The metal is placed in the beaker and the volume changes to 1.3 liters, so we have a beaker which is 1 liter. What happens is we put in this piece of metal and what's going to happen to the water? It's going to rise, of course. So let's call this the water level. It rises to 1.3. So if it rises to 1.3, the volume of this metal is going to be 
0 0.3 liters. So we have the volume, we have the mass. You can find the density of the metal using D equals M over V. Properties of matter, density, as I said, one gram per centimeter cubed is the same thing as one gram per mil. If here we have a cup of water, if the density is greater than one gram per mil, so it will sink, as in our example with copper. And if it's above one gram per mil, it will float. Air is above the water, this cork is above the water. That's uh, part one of our chapter one. We'll stop for now. Keep up with the work. Thank you for your time. And we'll talk uh, for part two in a moment.